Hiya, Pete. Delighted to be chatting with you again. It's been about a year since our last chat. Yeah, no, thanks very much for having me on. It's uh, nice to be back. She said, nice um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's been writing and stuff like that. But yeah, thank you very much. And so it's the, uh, the next one's nearly out soon. So it's uh, always a landmark when I'm on here. It means I've done another book. So <laughs> Excellent. Back. But yeah, thanks for having me back. Excellent, yeah, because this is this is the third chat, isn't it? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah, that's pretty good on landmarks, and um, maybe we're going to win the league in the quadruple this time yeah, as well. We'll have a chat about that one, but yeah. but we'll come back to that a bit later. So, just remind us a little bit about yourself uh, for our listeners and watchers when they see it. Uh, what hobbies do you have outside of writing, or is it all LFC related? <laughs> Uh, I am I am quite sad to be honest. It is pretty much just <laughs> so we it's great. But, uh, <laughs> it's not sad. But yeah, well, actually, well, yeah. I don't think it's sad, but I, I don't know what a lot of other people would do. But uh, yeah, like obviously a full time writing, so that's what I do most of the time. But obviously, go the match hobbies. I play forty toys a week. <laughs> um, sometimes play FIFA, which is you know at least that's not me. Oh, right, that's just me watching. Watching the forty. Talking about fuzzy, writing about fuzzy. That's basically my life, really. So, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> miss, that's about all I do, yeah. <laughs> okay. Nothing wrong with that at all, in my opinion, but yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, definitely, yeah. yeah. So, Pete, so far you've published three books, all with a football Liverpool related theme. Got Little at 100, uh, Crossing the Park, and now Sweeper Keeper, Tommy Lawrence, which is available for pre order. And we'll focus on that one. But first, tell us a bit more about the, the Little and Crossing the Park books. Yeah, well, uh, obviously, Little at 100 was the first one I did. That was, yeah. um, obviously, I'd done, well, I call myself the football historian. I'd done yeah. a lot of football history stuff and, and whatnot. And I, um, yeah, so basically, I had a family connection to Billy Little. But my auntie's best mate is uh, the sister of Billy Little. So that kind of got me the in, so to say. And then obviously I'd done a bit of writing. I'd, I'd been involved in my Liverpool program and magazine and stuff like that. So I uh, I just put out to a few publishers. Obviously it was Pitch who said yes. And went from there, really. I think that was obviously during COVID. And I think that helped a bit, getting hold of some of the former players and yeah. some of his teammates and family and friends and all that. But um, so it was a bit of an interesting one. Obviously it was the first book I'd ever done, but it was like... Uh, a lot of phone calls and remote stuff and mm. try to research as much as I could from home. But that obviously, hopefully, I thought it went quite well and I quite enjoyed doing it. And then Crossing the Park was obviously about the players who played for both Liverpool and Everton. Yeah. And uh, no, I'm sure like every other family in Liverpool, there's a few blues and a few reds in, in everywhere. And mm. one of the, um, I'll say, more favourite blues in the family was... Less than less than happy to be seeing a red book on the um, on on the the mantelpiece after I brought it out. So that just kind of got me thinking: like, is there a way I could just try and at least entertain both sides of the city? And that idea came to me, and I saw no one had really properly done it. Like a few people like to think, I'm sure, it frustrates you as much as me. The football started in 1992, but um, no one had really gone right back and had a look at everyone who had done it, and then obviously with. Everton leaving Goodison and it's going to no longer be across a park for much longer than sure. I thought it was. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, Crossing yeah. the city. Yeah, that's it. So maybe yeah, getting a couple of buses and a train doesn't sound as good. As, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think obviously Connor Cody being there and Rafa just going, it all seemed like a good time to do it. And hopefully there isn't another player who does it before they move or maybe hopefully there is and I can bring another chapter out. But um, yeah, it'd be nice to ask kind of the end of the story. And then obviously now we're on Tommy Lawrence, which I was fortunate enough while I was doing Crossing the Park. That I know you've had Jeff Golden on before. I think yeah. he was approached by um, Tommy's family to do the book and he was working on something else. So he recommended me quite kindly. And it was probably a bit sooner that I wanted to sign up for another one because I hadn't even finished crossing the park before I'd signed up to start doing this one. But there was a bit of a daunting feeling. But then I'm glad I did it because obviously it was um, people obviously haven't seen it yet. But I think it was it is interesting story to tell of on and off the field. And um, yeah, it was just obviously kind of just continued on the same train. And now here we are, three books deep. Brilliant. 
Yeah, I was just gonna um, just gonna come on to the, your new book. You know, the sweeper keeper Tommy Lawrence. I was gonna say I've been following it with vested interest on Facebook on Empire of the Cop and with Jeff Goulding, You know, on Facebook and you and I knew it was gonna happen. And I was just keeping an eye on it. But uh, yeah, so go and tell us a bit more about that. And then, um, well, you know, so a lot of people won't know where Tommy got this nickname from either the the legendary flying pig. So give us a bit of info behind the all the book then as well. Yeah, well, I think there's obviously a few reasons to do Tommy Lawrence. I think, you know, I know it's something we'll touch on later, but he has to have the famous interview, which kind of came to me. I was doing a few, like, I did a few talks in, the, in a couple of schools and I was talking to, like, year one, year two kids, you know, we were, we were born after the interview, never mind after Tommy's playing days. And <laughs> some of them yeah. had seen that interview before. And I think that, that obviously was a, a good way in that at least he's in, he's relevant, so to speak. You know, I'm not yeah. saying that Billy Little wasn't or whatever, but yeah. it's hard to get an old player who you can try and feel who is kind of relevant. So that helped. And then obviously I think whatever you say his name, as you said, the first thing everyone says is, ah, oh, the flying pig or ah, oh, the first <laughs> sweeper keeper. So to have like, to have two such famous nicknames about yourself as well, there's not many players who you immediately think of a nickname straight away as soon as you get them. So I thought, that was obviously interesting. And then from speaking with the family, like a lot of stuff which people won't know until they read the book, just how um, how how poor his, his financial life was basically after after football and how let down he was by Liverpool and Tramia yeah, in the sense of what happened afterwards. And I think maybe male pride and all stuff like that and not asking for help just meant it got worse and worse for him. And obviously I don't want to, ruin too much or say yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. like it's um, yeah I think all those little things added together and then add on he's part of that Shankly team and like he came in right as they, got, they kicked off and then he left at that Watford game which was such a pivotal game for, for the full at the time and the start of the 70s and the, and the change of the two sides and Ray Clements takes over and you know the, the legacy of him as well so I think he just he touches on so many massive events in the full's history and mm. Maybe because he was a bit of a a quiet player after after football, that he, he's kind of been forgotten a bit about a bit. But when you look back at what he did and what he achieved, what he was part of, you know, it's there's no doubt he's one of the greatest to to have ever played for Liverpool. Obviously, it's just maybe unfortunate for him that the greatest came right after him. Yeah, yeah absolutely. But um, just going back to that flying pig thing, it was all about being a bit a bit overloaded in the uh, in the belly area, really, wasn't it? Even though he wasn't a massive lad, but you know, it doesn't take much for for fans to pick up on things like that, does it? Yeah, well, it, it was kind of something that was a disagreement between players and fans and people who I spoke to. Like, yeah, a few of them had different opinions. I think Chris Lawler was saying that it was never the players, and then. One of the other players I spoke to said it was Ian, Ian St. John who started it, and then the fans <laughs> never start that. It was opposition fans, and so it's, it's I, I didn't really get to the bottom of where it exactly started, but uh, it was yeah. quite tongue in cheek. I think it wasn't me- meant to be as, as mean as maybe it sounds today, but yeah, I think he was about 13 stone, which I don't think is um, I don't <laughs> think too much, but certainly that myself would be unhappy about him um, about reaching 13 stone, so um. Uh, I don't think you can accuse too much of him, but in a way, it's a, it was a compliment just how his his athleticism didn't match his size, so to speak. So for him to be flying and catching and being fearless and flying into tackles as much as anything else is is massive. And then obviously, as you say, sweeper keeper, you know, I think it was a you know, he, he was coined that just again because it was his fearlessness of running off the line and being the first person to do that. And, you know. In, a, in an age where you could pass the ball back to a goalkeeper and you pick it up, it would really encourage them not to come off the line. So for him to be, you know, such a, a bucket and last line of defence, and also to Bill Shankly and Paisley and all and all the coaching staff for trying that out as well, you know, because I think he wanted to play out quite a lot. He played out in training. I think, you know, that all kind of worked together to make a very modern change in, in the way he was playing. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, I'm sure we'll find about it when we read the book. And yeah. I haven't read it yet. I know Terry has. I right? have. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. You, you tell, tell us again about the, the first chapter. You used that, that the brilliant coincidence in the first chapter where he has a chance meeting with a local news reporter. For anyone, and I can't imagine there's many, it would never hear this. Can you remind us what happened? Yeah, so it's obviously the, I think it's called the Vox Pox or yeah. something like that. I'm yeah. not even sure. Voice of the I people. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's on BBC Northwest tonight. They're just asking, you know, the Derby, Liverpool versus Everton. You know, it was the, the, the famous game where it was shown in both stadiums. And I think, yeah. you know, Anfield had the big screens and then the game was at Goodison. So it's the it's the biggest derby ever in terms of ticket sales because they they sold out both grounds. There was queues around the corner, and obviously just I think it was because it was when Van Dyke made his debut. I think it was the first night game in the FA Cup at, since something like that. It was that was the reason why they were doing it. But um, yeah. yeah, they're just walking around the streets and they're asking, you know, what what are your memories of the game to a few old blokes basically, and then mm-hmm. just by chance one of the people they ask is just, oh, do you remember the game? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> as well but I played in it and then <laughs> he, um, he's scrambling the, the reporter to try and <laughs> pretend that he knows who it is but he's got no idea and he has to answer what, what's your name again sorry and he's oh, Tommy Lawrence like, oh, I thought it was Tommy Lawrence yeah, but... <laughs> yeah. what are the chances of this um, I'm just wondering whether you remember the Derby match in 1967 at Goodison FA Cup fifth round and it was shown on a big screen at Anfield at the that's same right time. do you remember it yeah, I do I played in it did you I was goalkeeper for Liverpool Really? Yeah. Oh, well, that's a stroke of luck me meeting <laughs> nice. you. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, can you remind me of your name? Please? Tommy Lawrence. Tommy, nice to meet you. What, what do you remember about it? It was a great game, yes. Alan Ball scored the winner. He did indeed. Yeah, he? he did, yeah. yeah. He didn't have a clue, <laughs> did he? Yeah, he had, uh, he had absolutely no idea. No. I think uh, I think Tommy said he thought it was like a setup because like, the reporter was shaking and, and all stuff like that. He didn't think it was real. And then, obviously not being part of a social media age, not really yeah. realising how big it went. But yeah, it, 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 I think one of the videos alone has got over 11 million views on YouTube and yeah. there's about 50 odd videos on there and they've all getting hundreds of thousands of views themselves. So yeah, it, um, it, it, it was a very yeah. chance meeting that meant yeah. that it, it was great because it gave him another... It gave them relevance once again to yep. the modern Liverpool fans and the former Liverpool fans who, who would watch them play. And I think, you know, it's it's just that little glint in his eye and his like his, his selflessness that he's not trying to big himself up. But like, you know, how dare you ask? I've won two leagues, I've won the FA Cup, I'd, and I'm walking in the city, and you don't even know who I am. It's the fact he's almost, you know, he's almost sorry to connect him and say, "Oh, no, I'm sorry, I played." And I think. Yeah, I think as soon as you watch it once, you can understand why it just it went down so well, and I think everyone loves it. Yeah. Once they see it. Yeah, fr- from the other side of the coin, when you do those vox pop things, when I did a bit of work with Radio City, uh, and I was a fresh boy, you know, you go onto the streets to do these things, and you're just given questions to answer, ask, and you don't even know who you're talking to half the time. So it could be somebody who didn't have a clue about sport, you know, and he's gone out there and he's bumped into Tommy Lawrence. So you've got to feel for the guy as well at the same time. Like, oh, so it must be difficult. Yeah, yeah. But... It's just, I love the way he goes, like, oh, sorry, what was your name again? As if it was on the tip of his tongue. It's quite far from the tip of his tongue, nothing. Yeah. Tell us about the book, where the book launched, Peter. You've got one in the church in Oakfield Road, Liverpool, uh, which is also a charity. Events, isn't it? In aid of uh, Spirit of Shankly SOS. Plus, you've got another one in Warrington. Yeah, yeah. So, um, obviously, the first one in Liverpool is uh, basically I've got two because obviously Liverpool is the way he had his career, where he'll always be best known, and that was why I wanted to make sure we did, we did one there. And then the other ones in the the Pack Horse, which is I'd say it's almost a character of the book because it's him. <laughs> It's such a famous place for for him, and obviously, you know, I think as soon as you start reading the book, you know, cultures might not mean much, and that's why I have to say it's the Warrington book launch because it, I don't think everyone know even knows where it is. But as soon as you uh, as soon as you start reading it, you realise how important such a small town was to to Liverpool itself. Obviously, Roger Hunt and Tommy Lawrence both Roger grow Hunt, up, yeah, yeah, a stone so away from each other, and you know, for them to go on and have such a massive part of obviously. Roger Hope wins the World Cup with England and Tommy Lawrence is, you know, obviously, as I said before, winning the league twice, winning the FA Cup. So uh, the chance to have it in that pub, I just thought was was too good not to have. So, um, yeah, we've got it in there. And the other one, as I said, as you said, sorry, is the church on Oakfield Road right by Anfield and raising money for the Spirit of Shankly's uh, former players funded it. So I know, I don't really want to say like who and why because obviously it's not my place to do it. But, yeah. you know, this generation of players possibly the last generation, maybe the one after as well, who will ever need financial support. And, you know, they're getting older and older and 
the support they, they should have should be there from the club. But yeah. I think Spurs to Shankly have helped quite a few of you know the team who, who won so much under Shankly and moving into Paisley's time. So um, I just spoke to the family really because you know, like I did with the Cross in the Park launch, I did um, fan support and food banks. I wanted to all proceeds to go to that, and mm. I just thought it'd be nice to do something. Then it was their idea to. They didn't want to make any money off it either. They just wanted to try and support something. And that's, I think that's the perfect, you know, charity, so to say. Of you know, the, these players do need to help, and you know, we can obviously talk about what are their mates, and that that then helps out. You know, a couple of others who might need support. And as I said, when you read the book and you see what happened to Tommy, you know, if something like that was in place for him, it would have made a massive difference for him. So I think. You know, as, and as I said, then you know the players nowadays aren't going to need this in in 20, 30, 40 years time. So well, multi millionaires, aren't they? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So it'd be nice if one of them could come and <laughs> come yeah. and pay for it all for us and give a donation. But yeah, it's, it? uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it, it, yeah. Basically, I just thought it'd be nice. It's a nice way to try and give some money back to the reason why anyone would want to read this book it's because they were felt so attached to this era and such a special era of course history and this is a, a real way you can help them out and obviously hopefully read the book which would be great for them for myself and obviously for Tommy's family as well yeah nice touch yeah yeah yeah, yeah I totally agree yeah please on your website uh, Linktree Peter Kenny Jones you've got details of special signed copies of the book tell us how and where we can get these from yeah so my uh, my actual website is probably the worst URL, you can probably have an article. It's <laughs> got your name on it. Yeah. yeah, but if you just um, if you just search my name really on Google, yeah. that's probably the best way to do it. But yeah, yeah. just go on there. There's, I can't even fully remember all the ones I've got, but I think I've got a, you can get the book, you can get the sign book. I've yeah. done like an alternative cover and I've done like a VIP package where basically you get a couple of like copies of programs from the biggest games in his career. Yeah. I've got like an alternative cover I've done, obviously you get it signed and then I've got like some pack horse memorabilia because as I say I think once you read it it, it does kind of make you want to go and have a pint in that pub just because yeah. of uh, the stories that are there but um, I think yeah I, I've got some stuff from there I've got like a little thing from his interview just to, like kind of like a piece of memorabilia from that and yeah and I've, I've got quite a few like book plates and stuff that I've had from all the interviews I was fortunate enough to do as well so you can get a couple of them because I've got I think I only got like 10, 20 signed in each interview I did so there's not many of them but obviously if you want to get any of the people I spoke to I can get the book plates in the book for you as well so that's obviously all only through my website okay yeah so how did you um, how did you get in touch with a lot of the ex-players to get their stories about playing with Tommy and uh, was it easy or did you have contacts or did you have to go through a player and a friend and a friend or you know that sort of thing yeah, but well, I'd had a couple of them, fortunately, with the, the little book, like uh, the likes of yeah. George Scott and Ian Callaghan, who I was also able to speak to again. But um, obviously a massive part of it was, was Tommy's family. No, I think it's Stephen nice and that, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Stephen and Tracy is, is two of his, yeah. his kids. Yeah. Were like, obviously, they're the main driving force that this book's happened. Obviously, I was fortunate enough to write it, but it was there. Their wishes to try and get this story out there that that meant that we are you know I'm, I can now talk about it but um, yeah I think a lot of the kids of Shankly's players they're still very much in touch and you know there was some some letters sent out some some things are tracked down you know I managed to get a hold of, of Phil Borsma who I think provides some of the more comical lines of it within the within the book in the year. Um, I tried to track him down forever and he literally lives around the corner and he lives opposite <laughs> me, me missus his mum and dad. So I was seeing him. Oh my word. Oh, you wouldn't How believe it. When I was looking for him sometimes, but you know, just like, <laughs> just stuff like that. It's just, you know, it's a bit frustrating but funny when you when you manage to do it, but, you know, speaking to, just speaking to loads of them, it's, it's a real thrill just to know, as, as a fan more than anything else, just to be able to, to have that experience of speaking to some people who, you know, who are so important in the history. And even if they don't realise it themselves, if they play any small part, I think, you know, any Liverpool fan wants to hear as much as you can from anyone who even had one training session and had never mind had played 100 odd games for the club. So, yeah, it was letters, friends of friends, Facebook, um, stalking the internet, a lot of other stuff. But, you know, I, I got there in the end. Please, yeah, I was going to ask you something. I think you mentioned it near the beginning when Steve asked about hobbies. 
the other the full known as the football historian. You also write for the Empire of the Cop, freaking podcasts. Podcasts seem. Are you working full time as, as this? Is this your occupation now, football historian? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, tech, well, I'm not supposed to be technically. I'm like a full time in Empire of the Cop, but I'm self employed. Right. So, I, um, okay. so I work five days a week, um, yeah. eight hours a day. So, it's, it is a full time job, but obviously, I'm free to do whatever the stuff I want. So, I've got like, hmm. I haven't fully branched out to it yet, but I've started like my own Instagram and TikTok and yeah. Facebook. Or stuff like that when I've started putting like videos and stuff like that on every day when I'm, I'm trying to build up to maybe be able, one day get my own podcast and maybe I can get you to one as guest one day that'd be good oh, but him um, nice yeah yeah um, just stuff like that I'm just trying to trying to build it up because obviously I you know I've enjoyed doing the books and all that and I I don't know what I think I will go back in the future but I just thought you know it's I'd like to try and maybe mix it up a bit and see see what else I can do and and go from there so um, yeah full time doing whatever I can just to try and not on like a big head of the way, but just try and make a name for myself and try and just get a, a comfortable living from, from doing something I enjoy, which you know I've got to this stage when a lot of people said it wouldn't be possible to do anything yeah. like this full time. So hopefully just keep going and see see what I can get. So what's your verdict on the season so far? And your reaction to the bombshell news. Well, we all know what that is about yeah, Jürgen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'd rather not talk the, the first bit. I'm a lot more happy to talk about than the second bit. But um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> obviously, you know, we've we I think we've done better than any of us probably expected. Yeah. Any of the pool fans would have expected we'd have done at the start of the season. I, you know, yeah. I think my hopes were that we just got Champions League football again, and I was happy for that to happen. Maybe try and win a cup, see where see where we go. But um. Yeah, we're on track for a quadruple. <laughs> it's not going to be easy. There's a lot of stuff to do. It's only the middle of Feb, but you know we're still in the in the race for all four and in a pretty good position for all of them as well. So obviously, I think the main one that we all want to win is the league, and yeah, that's going to yeah. also understandably be the hardest one. And you know, it, it's just annoying that City is so good. Yeah. It's uh, it's getting more annoying that Arsenal are doing quite well as well. And I think. You've basically just got to win every game to the end of the yeah. season, and that's the only way you can guarantee winning it. Which obviously sounds pretty straightforward, but I think you're going to have to be as close to perfect as possible to get over the line. That means beating City at Anfield. That means not dropping points, uh, silly points away from home. And yeah, it's got to be it's got to be a, a fun ride. And you know, obviously, as you said, with Jurgen Klopp going. We're almost guaranteed at the end of the season it's going to be special anyway because yeah. even if we we capitulate, we we'll end up in seventh and we're out of everything. We're still going to enjoy that last game because it's going to be the goodbye to Jurgen Klopp. And as much as it's going to be emotional, I think the sadness will start as soon as he walks down the tunnel for the last time. I think you know from what he's made us all be like, it's going to be just passion and support and loud, and it's going to be exciting to be there. Which you know. Maybe isn't what you'd always think on his last day, but I think it will be it will be an exciting event, and then the future starts after that. But I think you know, I think it's 102 days till the FA Cup final, which is his last possible game. <laughs> I was looking at it yesterday, so there's not long left. But you know, his first message to us all was doubt us to believe us, wasn't he? And you know, there's no yeah. point in not believing in the fact that we can go win all four because that's that's the whole point of being a football fan is that you you believe that you can have these great achievements and it's not going to be easy but why not why can't we go and, and do it all yeah touch wood definitely yeah for this season who's been your standout player anyone any surprises there is it Salah is it Van Dijk who's jumped yeah. out for you the first few weeks I think Sobersly looked like he was definitely going to be the favourite for me because he was um, yeah. Yeah. yeah he was doing something really special and yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm not saying he hasn't exactly fallen off but like he was he was unbelievable, and I think he's yeah. now very good. And I, I think maybe the Arsenal game showed how important he is, you know, because we really did miss him in that match. But um, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think Van Dyke looked very much back to his best, he yeah. said, you know, and I think Allison, it's just, it's hard to say both of them after their most recent game together was Arsenal, and probably the, the, the only time you'll see anything like that happen in their whole career together. But yeah, I think you just realize how important Allison is, I think, because. Yeah. I think City are an unbelievable team, but Edison doesn't get tested anywhere near as much as Allison sure. does. And yeah. the amount of times he saves us, I think 
in saying it honestly, obviously you like exciting players, you want goals, you want Salah breaking records, yeah. even Van Dyke just pushing people off the ball. But I think not something that I probably ever thought I'd say, but my favourite player probably is the goalkeeper. And <laughs> maybe that's me. Uh, looking at Tommy Lawrence, that wasn't even a deliberate segue there. But yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, no, Allison yeah. is just he's just I think he's the possibly the only player that you can comfortably say is the best in the position best in the world in his position in our team. I think Van Dyke probably is as well, but there's probably gonna be a lot of people who have a debate with you. But I think Allison's just so comfortably the best goalkeeper that you know, if you've got people like that and you it's you're pretty much in a in a good place to go and win stuff and Hopefully that's what, what we do this year. Yeah, I, I think as well that we well I read good news today. Um, we've got Andy Robinson back in the team. Allison's back again training. I think he's fit. Uh, Mo Salah he's training again. That's bringing more you know world class stars you know back into the team at a time when we're already top of the league. It's going to be exciting the next half of the season. Yeah, I think against Burnley we saw it was a bit. It was a bit scrappy, wasn't it? It was hard to get a yeah. team together, and I think. Losing Sobers like, and then obviously yeah, yeah. Bradley so soon before the Arsenal game, I think yeah. it didn't give us much chance to like prepare properly for it. You know, coming a matter of days after Chelsea, you know, losing two probably starters for the game in mm. the right in the eve of the match, I think was um, was it's quite understandable that that would disrupt how you played. But mm. you know, for us to get through the Burnley game, and then from now on, fingers crossed. I feel like we've been saying this every week, but from now yeah, on. Yeah. It's just going to get better in terms of injuries and availability. That I think you know we should hopefully get a buzz and get a boost every time someone comes back. Because as you say, if you're a player today and a Mo Salah walks on the glass for the first time and mm. Allison's back out there, Gomez yeah. is back, and you're yeah. just like, yeah, this is this is what we need. And unfortunately, you know, the likes of Thiago and Matip are going to be back in there. So there's a few of them who are gone. But when you're your senior teammates in the in the gym working hard and then desperate to come out and then you, they're obviously going to feel happy for them as well so it just gives everyone a boost every time you get a player back and yeah hopefully for Brentford there's a few more and it gives them another week and you know hopefully they're all in, in good form for Luton and obviously the final yeah so it's good yeah, yeah. so what's in the pipeline with the uh, bookwise next book then Peter yeah well I, I get married in December so I've <laughs> had oh, nice <laughs> having a break <laughs> Thank you, thank you. I've had um, I, 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 this makes me sound unprofessional, but the last two have been a bit close to the deadline, maybe I should say. So it's a uh, the stress of having that over me when like the last two have been due like October, November, and I get married in on New Year's Eve. Either. So to have wow. the thought of that stress hanging over me a month yeah. before all that, all everything else is going on, I thought I'm sure have a year out and to say I've kind of started me social media stuff and all that. So maybe see where that takes me and hopefully that's a bit less of a stress <laughs> by the time we get there. And so I do think I will return one day, but I've, uh, yeah, I've just given myself a little bit of a hiatus and, and maybe just kind of see what ideas come my way. And you know, I've had a couple of opportunities already, which I was, I don't want to say in case someone else takes them and I'll let them have the stuff. But um, yeah, I've had a couple of things. So hopefully those opportunities keep coming. And if not, I'm sure I can try and think of my own idea to go. Yeah, and of course, Empire of the Cops going to keep you busy anyway. So, uh, yeah, you'll have plenty on your plate. <laughs> Plus the wedding. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, enough, enough. Enough. yeah. <laughs> so far, I think I asked you this last time as well. Your writing has all been non-fiction, football historian. Have you got an idea tucked away for a purely fictional, maybe a historical novel, maybe with ex-players involved as characters? Yeah, well, I can't say I have got an idea. Like, There's, there's a period oh. I like which not really isn't fully touched upon, which is just before Shankly. Like I, maybe Liverpool fans and me included like to think we're the, the best team that's ever existed. But I kind of like the, the thought of us being a terrible mid mid table second division team. I don't yeah. want it to ever see it with my own eyes, but I just like the uh, I like the fact that it happened. Prehistory. <laughs> yeah, like it's as you say, like People say football started in '92, and people seem to think Liverpool started in in '59. When there was obviously a lot of stuff that happened before, and yeah. maybe like the Phil Taylor era, and there's um, someone called Jimmy McInnes who uh, who yeah. I touch on in the book, and he he hung himself on the cop because of the stress of Liverpool getting such a big club. I think it was right after the Inter Milan semi final. Yeah. So uh, people like him, and just how the club changed so quickly, and it wasn't 
it wasn't fully ready for Shankly to, to drag it into the next era. Maybe, you know, because there's not so much stuff about that time, maybe that could be something you could you could work a damn United story type thing mm-hmm. into right what you think might happen between the walls type thing. But yeah, that's about as far as I've got, but not not more than that. Sounds great to me. I'd like the idea of that. Yeah, yeah, different. Yeah, yeah. Finally, from me, um, I think we, we may have asked you this before. What advice do you give to a new writer? But I'm going to put a tilt on it and say, what advice do you give to a new writer who's doing non-fiction like you've done? You know, with, yeah, you know, you're doing yeah. you're doing the facts, and you that's the difficult one. Is it research? But yeah. well, I think just do it is the is the main thing. You know, obviously you got to make mistakes, and you know, it's to be able to lean on people as well. I think there was people like. Johnny Stockland and Adrian Killen and LFC history and stuff like that. People don't even know. And the Chet Maraji is another one. Like there's, there's so many people yeah, who yeah. are like absolutely yeah. the knowledge who are him that don't even like they're so selfless. They don't want. They don't even hint that you'd ever have to pay for their things. They just have such a passion for Liverpool facts being correct that they just want to help you in, in any way they can. And obviously, I think maybe being cheeky and, and asking for help and and making sure you get stuff right. But then at the end of the day, it's just, it's writing a story. Obviously, it's a factual story, but I never ever think that I'm just writing a book of facts. If you're telling the story of something, and I always like, you know, all these, the three books I've done are basically just stories of people's lives. I've seen Crossing the Park, it's 32 lives, a lot shorter and quicker, and maybe easier for me to write. And then obviously with Billy Little and Tommy Lawrence, it's someone's full life from the day they're born to the legacy after they die. And it's just, you're just telling a story, basically, and just because it's true doesn't mean it's it's not a story. So I, I think that's basically all I yeah. say is yeah. if you if you're passionate of passionate enough about it, then why not write about it? And you know, obviously, it's it's good to look back at it, it's something that you've done, it's an achievement, and it's you know, it's <laughs> when you're in school, you're writing stuff to do it to get an A level, to get a GCSE, to do your SATs, whatever, but. It's like it just gives yourself another challenge to do. And, you know, there's a lot of times when you feel like it's impossible. And then at the end of it, in a few months' time, you're over in a box with your book on, with your name on. So it's, it's uh, yeah, it's rewarding, even if it's stressful and, and hard work. But, uh, yeah, just if you if you ever thought about maybe I should do it, just do it. Because even if no one buys it, you can buy 10 yourself and then someone has bought it, haven't you? So it's, it's fine. In peace, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure to stay uh, chat with you. It um, looks like there won't be one, another book released until after Christmas sometime, or you'll be starting it after the uh, happy occasion in December. But let's keep in touch, and thank you very much. No, 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 thank you very much. And as I say, hopefully you can, um, I can have you as guest the other way around one day on um, something that comes up. But it, yeah, hopefully it's not, I don't think it's the end of my writing. It's just a little yeah. bit of a break. But, bit of a gap, um, yeah. It's just um, hopefully, it, yeah, if people grab a copy of it and just just try and see what obviously how important yeah. Tommy Lawrence was to Liverpool, that's the um, that's the main reason I've I've had the chat I wanted to do it. But obviously, though, it's it's great to be able to to talk about the maybe the creative process behind it and stuff like that. It's always interesting. Maybe that's something you you talk about too much, but yeah, it's nice to have for him like minded people. And obviously, I've seen the other chats you've had. It's always interesting to. To see how everyone approaches everything differently, but yeah, just thank you very much, and That's hopefully okay. one day I'll be back on here, and if I'm not talking to you off screen okay. before. But well, listen, from me, thanks again for sending me the advanced copy. It's a brilliant read. Um, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. It's highly recommended. I appreciate it. Well, thank you. I think there's a uh, yeah, nice to get a couple of reviews in early. I think it always helps, and you know you have yeah, definitely yeah, that. yeah. But thank you. All right, but for now, peace. Cheers, mate. Oh, thank you. Nice thank you. Thanks, mate. Cheers. Bye.